Hello one and all, my name is John Clare, this is John Starcart, and as always, you are very welcome. Now today's piece I want to talk about is a piece called Nevermore. Now I base this on the poem by Edgar Allan Poe of the same title, Nevermore. And what I want to do for you now is I want to bring it up for you here, as you can see. No, 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 wrong one, that one. Okay, that's, yeah, that's the one. Okay, okay. You got a chance to have a look at it? Awesome. So what we'll do now is we'll go into the walkthrough. I'll show you how it's been done and we'll do that now. Okay, so here we are. We're in Procreate. But before we go into the time lapse and everything else, what, like what we would normally do, I'm going to bring up the original piece here. Now, this was the piece that I did uh, four years ago. I finished this in 2019. And I'm really happy with this piece. I think it's actually pretty damn good. But the problem is, I can't really talk about it with you or show you how I did it because I lost the time lapse. So what I wanted to do was, I wanted to create, I wanted to do another variation on the piece because I really like the poem, you know. And I think art inspires art, you know. You see it all, you know, throughout history, like you know, whether it's recreations of the Iliad or recreations of bi biblical stories or whatever else. So I wanted to do my own kind of artwork based on the poem. So as much as I can't talk about that piece, I can talk about this one. I recreated it over the weekend, so I had something to talk to you guys about. It was quite an involved piece, which I'll show you now. So let's go into canvas and canvas information. And I finished it on the 1st of October and we're recording this today on the 4th. So I literally just finished it more or less. The total strokes made were 14,404. Track time was 33 hours and 56 minutes. So as you can probably imagine, yes, it's a very involved piece. It took me a long time to do, but I'm pretty happy with the results. So anyway, let's go into our time-lapse replay. And here I am roughing things out. Okay. So the inspiration for the piece before we go into the actual time lapse, time lapse. In the poem, um, the main character he hears the rap rap rapping on his door, and he comes out and he answers the door and he sees a raven parked up on the bust of Pallas, which is a Greek hero from the Iliad, from the Trojan Wars. And this is the bit I wanted to recreate. So I looked for a reference, found something that was appropriate, and I started piecing this together. So here we are, drawing out the face and the helmet. So the thing is like, I mean, there's, there's a subtle difference between drawing statues of people and drawing people. Like, as amazing as so many stone workers are, whether it's Michelangelo and his st uh, statue of David or Donatello's statue of David with his per buttocks, if you're into that sort of thing. You can really tell that these men knew the materials that they were working with and were able to create absolute amazing pieces as a result. So I wanted to kind of keep that certain stoic, statued look, if that makes any sense. So. I spent a bit of time, you know, we'll punch in a little bit. A lot of time kind of went into doing the hair. And also you may notice is actually, if I do believe this is the first time there's a human face in any of my artwork and any of these um, videos that we've been doing. So this may be kind of shocking for people who assume that I only draw animals. Um, I have drawn people too. You know, I'm fairly familiar with the human form. Um, but this is the first time actually quite some time that I did it and I quite enjoyed it because it was very much a, a change of pace for me. So anyway, you know, getting all the information and the hair down, shading all that in, spending a lot of time on it. Because also what I did with this was, I mean, I used, as always, I only ever really used two brushes. So if I bring one up for you now. So, and the actual piece itself will indicate this quite a lot better. But a lot of the line work, that was all done using uh, technical pen this that brush there so um, and the reason why I, I used a lot of inking brushes a lot more than I would normally do with this particular piece 
is I wanted to pick out certain details. So I wanted to pick out details in the hair. I wanted to pick, I want to outline details in the face. I wanted it to be subtle. I didn't want it to look comic booky. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I love comic books, but I just wanted to kind of use black inking lines to pick out certain details. So that's what I did there. So anyway, let's hop back into the time lapse. So shading out the face, filling out the hair details, drawing the helmet as well. I mean, like in the original um, reference, the helmet was a lot more detailed. I wanted to kind of, I didn't see the point in actually going too ham in, you know, doing all the details of the helmet because I had enough work to do that ahead of me that I knew that I, I, I didn't really, I, I could keep that fairly simple without having to go you know, worry too much about the details. But as long as I got the shading right and it looked right, then hopefully um, it would be convincing in of itself. But what I really wanted to focus on was I wanted to focus on the Buster Palace and make him look as convincing and 3D as I could make him. So I spent a long time kind of shading, not just the face, but also the cloth work. See, the thing is, this is another thing I kind of miss. I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to love drawing like drapery and cloth work because there is something really satisfying about drawing cloth. I don't know what, you know, the details, the creases, the folds, you know, getting all that right. It's something I haven't done in a very long time and it's something I probably should revisit. Also like um, in the original reference, there was damage to the uh, shoulder. And I wanted to kind of keep that, but the problem was in the initial reference, it was quite a low res image. So what I did was, again, I kind of took a leaf out of, again, comic books, used my black outlines to kind of like pick out that um, detail to pick it and to make that information a bit more apparent. So yeah, I wanted to pick out that information and obviously I then shaded the rest of the um, cloth work. Also another thing in the original uh, reference that I used, there was like a big chain around him, made of snakes and the Medusa head. I didn't necessarily feel that was important because I knew that I'd be drawing a crow over the top of it. So rather than preserving that information, I just discarded it. The great thing about artistic license, I mean, anything that you feel is relevant, keep. Anything you feel is not relevant, get rid of. You know, you don't have to put it in there if you don't think it's important. And now this is me drawing the raven in question, the tormentor of our poor fella in, in the poem. So let's punch, punch in a good bit here now. So the, the original reference, this the reference I used for the bird, it wasn't actually a crow. It was a corvid, but not a crow. It was a blue jay. But again, great thing about artistic license. And you know, if your initial reference isn't exactly what you want but you feel you can change it later on do it man like i used other references for the crow's head or the raven's head sorry and for the tail feathers because i knew the tail feathers would be a lot more prominent in a raven because they have much they have longer they have longer tail feathers and they have kind of spade shaped tail so i wanted to show that with the tail feathers as well also i kind of repositioned the feet as well main reason because i wanted to make sure that i the crow looked like it was planted on the bust um and it was pointed out to me that i wasn't entirely successful with it it is what it is you don't always get everything right so again using my inking because again these aren't you know crow's feet are a pain in the ass to draw they really are i mean as much as i like drawing the rest of the bird i, I especially don't like drawing the feet because uh, they're ugly and they're weird and they're hard to draw and that's my excuse and i'm sticking to it <laughs> so anyway um, so, so in terms of the in terms of drawing the head the head itself, like you can kind of get away with just using you know more kind of fur like shading. I f I think because the actual bird itself, like we'll hop out of time lapse for for a second, like it's not necessarily all that important to draw every single feather because they're more like they're what would be called contiguous feathers. So they they're kind of like more like fur than anything else. So I didn't think it was entirely important to draw draw the feathers as feathers on the head and the, on and on the neck of the bird it's only really when you get into the body that you know those feathers become much more 
kind of formed as feathers, so to speak. So it's important then for me to make sure that they look like feathers as you move down through the rest of the body. So anyway, back into the time lapse. Moving all the way along. So once those pain in the ass crow feet were drawn, then what I did was I kind of started drawing out each of the feathers and, and shading them in. And here, what I did was, I kind of mapped them out lightly, very faintly. And once I was kind of like happy with where everything was, then I picked again, using my technical pen, which doesn't really show up well here because of the lower resolution of the time-lapse, but picked out each of the light, um, I picked out, using my technical pen, the outline of each of the feathers and then kind of filled it in accordingly. So anyway, once I was happy with uh, the bird and the bust, I had to kind of try and bring them together. So, because they're both on separate layers. So what I ended up doing is, as you can probably see, is I selected, once I was able to work out exactly where it was, using clipping masks and a few other clever little bits and pieces, I was able to kind of get rid of all the information behind the bird. And then just kind of fill everything else out with a bit of extra shading. Put a nice gothic script on the bottom there, Nevermore. And that was it, that's the piece. Anyway, let's start rounding this out now, shall we? Okay, so that was Nevermore. As you can imagine, if you're well familiar with these videos by now, you'll notice that this print will indeed be up for sale on the website, www.johnsdarkart.com. So if you'd like to go over there, uh, pick yourself up a print, help us support in what we're doing, uh, be very much appreciated. So yeah, www.johnsdarkart.com. Thank you very much. So anyway, um, one thing I wanted to talk about actually, I think it's quite pertinent. I showed this to my colleague and good friend Roman Puch. And God bless his art, he has this thing where he, he, he he'll, if he notices something that's not quite right, and it's no criticism of him at all, but he'll always get, he, he'll turn around and he'll notice that if something isn't right, he'll point it out. You know, and he doesn't do it in a bad way. It's not like he's doing it for, you know, his motivation is to see the best in what you're doing, so to speak. And he'll, he'll make suggestions as to what can be better. This is what's referred to as constructive criticism. The criticism he gave, and I think it's actually fair criticism, is that one of the feet of the crow doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look like it's entirely planted on the bust of Palace. And he's right. He's absolutely right, 100%. And... You know, I think it's important that with constructive criticism, look, it's never nice to take, right? It always does prick the ego somewhat. But I think it's important because if you actually want to be better at what you do and you're lucky enough to have people around you that you trust who, for the right reasons, are coming up to you and saying, this could be better and here's how it could be better then as much as it may not always be nice to take i think it should be it should be listened to because if you as an artist want to better your work then you're going to have to take on constructive criticism now there is a fine line constructive criticism when someone comes up to you and points out a problem with your piece and then gives you a solution that you could then either act upon or not now i'm not going to act upon it on this particular piece because the way i look at it once it's done it's done you know, but it's worth remembering that criticism for the next time. So then you could improve your piece again. And it, so if I do at some point want to recreate this again, wouldn't rule it out because us artists sometimes revisit old works and think that we can do it better and try it again. And now maybe in a year or two, I may feel I could do a better version of Nevermore. You know, I think it's important to take on criticism and take it with, take it in the, manner in which it's intended but again fine lines there's constructive criticism and there's someone just being a dickhead 
all right? And unfortunately, there is a lot of that. And I've encountered that myself quite a lot in the past, where people will just turn around to you and say, uh, it's not very good, is it? One particular instance that I can recall, I was in a gallery exhibition in Hoxton in East London. And I was standing at the bar on my own, getting slightly tipsy on, on cider, because it was the height of summer. And someone looked at one of my pieces and said, because it was a portrait of the singer Katie Tunstall. And someone turned around and said, mm, is it supposed to be Katie Tunstall? And it's like, you fuck, you cheeky bastard. That that was awful to hear. I mean, I did want to go up to him and punch him. I mean, that was my initial reaction. But, you know, thankfully, touch wood, I didn't. <laughs> But very often, I suppose, like people, people will often take shots at you when you're not, when they think you're not paying attention, or you, they think you're not listening, or you're not there. So they feel safe to do so. And have I been guilty of that in the past? Definitely. But the one thing you need to bear in mind is that's just someone being a dickhead for the sake of being a dickhead. And I can't put it in more blunt terms than that, you know. And as awful as that to hear, that needs to be discounted. That needs to be absolutely wiped from your mind you can't allow that kind of thing to impact you as the creative because people will often be a dick because they think they can be a dick especially on the internet because they can hide behind a handle or a pseudonym they feel that their identity is concealed so therefore then they can offer you their unwarranted unsolicited and unconstructive criticism offer you their opinion and as the old saying goes opinions are like arseholes everyone has one you gotta bear that in mind if you're an artist and you're listening and you're having to deal with that the best thing to do is either not engage or confront it head on but the problem with, with confronting it head on is you can do it once you can do it twice but if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it's going to expend a lot of your energy and it's just not worth it. That's something that you need to bear in mind as an artist. Also, another thing when it comes to criticism, and this is something that I've been guilty of, and I'm not going to name the name of the artist because I don't think that would probably go down well. But there was an artist um, who put up a piece up on social media. I think it was on Facebook. And it's a dude that I... I'd previously met but we were barely acquaintances we were not friends you know and I put my foot in my mouth a little bit I saw a piece that he did it was a portrait of a woman and you can tell that this guy doesn't really have his fundamentals like he's very good at doing detail but his fundamentals and form and structure aren't quite there and it was a picture of a woman but the eyes weren't on the same plane. I can't describe it. It looked weird. So, in good faith, in fairness to me, but it was unsolicited. I did go. I didn't. I did message him and I said, "Hi there, man. Um, just looked at your work there, dude. Um, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I did see a few issues in your work that I think you could. Um, that I want to point out that I think you can improve upon." Um, and I gave him. I told him exactly what the issue was and I told him how I felt it could be improved. But the problem was it wasn't asked for. And this is the problem with unsolicited criticism is that sometimes what you're really doing is, it is you may mean well in what you do, but if it's not asked for, it's unwarranted. If it's unwarranted, all you're really then doing is putting your foot in your mouth. You know, you've got to be careful with that. You know, if you feel, even if you do it in the right, even if you feel that you could, you're doing it for the right reasons, sometimes that, it's it, like for instance, it's different, different with me and Roman. Me and Roman work together all the time and we criticize each other's work. Like, he's not really an artist in the same way I am, but he's a photographer in the same way that I am. And sometimes I'll look at his work and I'll say, yeah, that can be improved, that can be improved, that can be improved. Maybe crop in there to improve the composition or something like that, you know. We have a working relationship, we trust each other. As much as it may, again, prick the ego, we're doing it from the, we know each other well enough that we're doing it from, we, we understand each other's motivations as to why we would say that. But when you don't really know someone, when you don't really, 
when you're not, even if you're just acquainted, I think you've got to be very careful about offering any kind of criticism, especially if it's unsolicited. If you are going to do it, ask first. Say, look, man, um, do you mind if I offer you a few think, uh, offer you a few tips, or do you mind if um, I offer you a few a bit of constructive criticism here, mate? Be nice about it first off, and ask. If they say yes, grand, let me know what you think, then do it. If they say no, then respect their wishes because they don't know you from Adam. You're not friends. Uh, you don't have an ongoing working relationship. Don't be a dick like I was because I, fu I fully admit now looking back on it, I was in the wrong. Even though my motivations were right, the way I went about it was incorrect. And all I did really was insult the artist in question. And I think that was wrong of me. So in terms of criticism, let me just kind of round this out. Criticism is incredibly important for you to, for you to improve as an artist, for you to improve your work and to um, better yourself. But at the same time, when it comes to criticism, only take it from people you trust. Ignore bad faith criticism, because it's not criticism, it's just someone being a dick and if you are going to offer criticism make sure you uh, make sure you do it with tact you know do it with a bit of empathy because at the end of the day you are dealing with a fellow artist and you are dealing with someone who you know has an ego of their own has feelings of their own and they've probably poured a lot of time and a lot of effort into that piece of work so again be tactful be nice don't be a dick and hopefully, if you're producing work, that will better what it is that you produce. And then you will share it with the world in whatever way, whatever way you see fit. So anyway, my name's been John Clare. This has been John Starkart. And as always, you have been very welcome. Until next time.